Why do we tend to go back to our old lives when there's something new and better waiting for us? It's a human tendency that we're gonna tackle as we go through our new series, Red, White, and Deja Vu. Let's hop in now and see what this week's message is. So in preparation for this series, I, uh, I met with uh, a, a local leader uh, who happens to be a Jewish man. I wanted to pick his brain on, on all things Judaism and how, like, well, how, what is the current state of the, of the Jewish uh, religion and just pick his brain on salvation and things of that nature. And as we, we are talking, uh, he, he references, he's like, I'm not really big into organized religion. I'm just really Jewish by, by heritage. I actually kind of hate religion. No offense. And I was like, none taken. And uh, he's like, because I, I see religious leaders, they all have like their things in their closet. They all have things that they're, that, you know, that in their background. And he's like, kind of like you with Daddy Daughter Day. And I was like, what? And like, I almost like fell out of my chair because if you, you guys follow me on social and whatnot, I have this thing called Daddy Daughter Day on Fridays. I take my time off and I hang out with my daughter. We go to the gym and we go to Chick-fil-A. She loves it. That's what we do. Hashtag Daddy Daughter Day. It's a beautiful, awesome thing with my daughter. And as he seen me on social media, he drew the assumption that I had my daughter from another woman and I got her on Fridays, and that was our day, and she and I have two older sons, and so he just assumed that at one time I got a little loosey-goosey, had a daughter, and I get her on Fridays. And, uh, and so I about fell off my chair, because I had never in a million years thought that's an image that I needed to protect against as I'm hanging out with my daughter on, <laughs> on Fridays. And, uh, but my daughter, she just turned three, uh, I want to protect her. I want to protect her purity. I, I'm, I'm her dad. And, and, and so there is that, like, I do fight for that. I do fight for, for that image and, and, and for her, her purity now and future purity as well. I, I will fight as a dad. The dad's in the room. You can relate to this. I, I'm going to fight against outside sources coming in and, and harming her purity. And there's also things that I don't do that I, I leave to Ava to help protect her purity as well. And, and so that that is something that I fight very, very hard against uh, and for. Uh, and so what we're going to be looking at today is another fight that has to be on our mind. The, the fight for my daughter's purity is of the utmost importance, but of even greater importance, not to minimize my daughter's purity, but to elevate this to a high importance, is fighting for the purity of the gospel message, something that can be distorted and ruined. And so that is something that we have to fight often to protect against and protect against people uh, attacking the, the gospel message. And so Paul, he, he had traveled around this region of the, of the country called Galatia. And uh, so these are a, a handful of churches. We're starting a series today called the Book of Galatians. And uh, we're going to be working through that actually for the next few months. And, uh, and so Paul is writing to a region of a country. This isn't just one single church. This is a handful of churches, young in the faith, young churches, much like Wellspring. And he's writing to them because they've lost sight of something. There are these people, this is a term that you're going to have to remember for the next few weeks, months, uh, called Judaizers. These are Jewish men and women uh, that have become Christians, and so they are known as Judaizers, people of the Jewish heritage that are now Christians. And so these Judaizers have come to this young church with, with Gentile converts, with, with non-Jewish converts, with some other Jewish converts. They, they're coming into this young, vulnerable church in preaching a message of legalism. They're, they're preaching a message that says, yes, we need Jesus. Jesus is good, groovy and all. He's great. But you need Jesus plus the Old Testament law. You need to bring in all of that old stuff that we were doing. You need to bring that all into play. And so it's Jesus plus the Old Testament law. And what will really come to a focal point is circumcision. And that was hard if, if you're a, an older man and you want to come to Jesus and you have these Judaizers preaching. Well, you, you have to say yes to Jesus, but you also have to go and get circumcised. That will prevent anybody from turning to Jesus. And so this was, this was a major concern in the church. Paul is preaching against this because he sees this as legalistic. And, and so legalism is, is basically something where, where we try to work in our own power. We try to earn something. We, we try to take on religion for ourselves, doing things in our own strength. Legalism is trying to define the relationship with God apart from how he would define it. 
We're trying, to, we're trying to, in our own work, shape the relationship outside of how God wants us to shape the relationship. We're trying to say, this is what God has established as a, as a re- working relationship between us and, and, and him. And we're trying to add laws to either, in our mind, strengthen that relationship or to, or to do whatever it is. But we're trying to manipulate that relationship. And that all comes back to legalism. Trying to please man over pleasing God is what is the end result. And so that's at the heart of the issue here in the book of Galatians. Fighting this, this gospel of grace, this gospel gospel at peace is at war with this gospel that would minimize the work of Christ. And so our big thought for the morning as we get started here is that uh, we, we must know the gospel to defend it. Paul is going to talk to this, this in the first 10 verses of Galatians. He's going to identify what the gospel is, and he's going to call us to fight and defend the true gospel message. And so this begs the question, what is, what is the gospel? And it demands our understanding. We, we, we have to ask the question, what is the true gospel message if we're going to defend it? And, and it begs the question, this demands that we would understand the true gospel message. And so Paul says this in the opening verses. He says, Paul, an apostle, not from men nor through man, but through Jesus Christ, God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches in Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. He, right from the beginning, is going to establish that he has credit to speak the way that he's speaking. Because as these Judaizers are, are trying, to, are trying to, to, to not convert, but trying to attack this church, attack their mindset, one of their initial uh, strategy, strategies is if we can discredit Paul, then they're going to discredit Paul's message. If I, can, if I can make them not respect Paul, then they're going to gravitate towards our legalistic approach to the gospel. And so they start. It's one thing to discredit the disciples. That's a little bit harder. Paul has a little bit of a history, which makes him, makes him a little bit of an easier target to discredit. Uh, and so they start trying to discredit, saying that he doesn't, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He has no room. He has no authority. And, and Paul's point is that God has established my authority. And by the way, by this time, by the time that I'm writing this book, your fellow disciples have already laid hands on me and affirmed my, my ministry. And so Paul kind of puts that to bed right away and then goes right on to the gospel message that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. He mentions this in the, in the opening verses, and he mentions that God gave himself for something, for our sins, that we were, we were rescued, that, that God is on this, this, this rescue mission to liberate us from our sins, that, that he didn't just send Jesus to, to die. He wasn't sitting up in heaven one day and being like, you know what, for kicks and giggles, I'm going to send my son down to earth, let him die a horrible death, and, and then raise him up again just to prove my power, and, this, and that's the only rationale behind it. God, G, Paul writes right in these opening verses that this is for our sins, that Jesus willfully went to earth, he willfully died for you and I because for you and I, there was wrath on us. That God's, God's measure was, is, is perfection. And that doesn't matter if you're like really imperfect or just a little bit imperfect. The standard is perfection and we've all failed. And so no matter what level of imperfection you're at, the penalty is the same. It's wrath. And our sin demands wrath. And so Jesus Christ chose to live a perfect life, did not have to have that same penalty. And so He died in our place as only he could because he was perfect. And so my sin that demands wrath, Jesus Christ died and rose again for me, for my sins. Wrath was taken out on my sin, but I just choose to believe that it was done in Jesus. And so by faith, we believe that. By faith, we have, we have accepted that. And why Paul begins with such a message, why this is such a pivotal point, is that this is a gospel message of grace. This is a gospel message where we brought nothing to the table. This is unearned. This is unmerited. This is something that we didn't have to work for. The point is, Christ did it all, and Christ is enough. This is based on the finished work of Jesus, not the finished work of Jason Coash. 
And, and, and so Paul needs to make this right from the beginning because what they're trying to argue is that we need to keep adding to the gospel, add to the gospel, add to the gospel, that, that this original gospel message is somehow incomplete. But in reality, we have nothing to add to it. It is finalized. Adding to the gospel message, adding the Old Testament law, isn't that just a wicked insult to our Savior that died for us? To think that he isn't sufficient or that his, his sacrifice wasn't good enough and that all of a sudden we have to add to it. Now we can, we can attack them with circumcision. We can say about you know, what they were doing back then, but, but we're accustomed to do that nowadays too in many different churches or many different faiths. We're, we're accustomed to say, yes, Jesus, 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 but then Jesus plus, Jesus plus. What, what are we inclined? Is it, is it Jesus plus baptism? Is it Jesus plus communion? Is it Jesus plus confirmation? Is it Jesus plus holy this, that, the other thing? It's, it, we need Jesus plus. You, you, you know of people that fill in the blank with all sorts of religious religious things when it's just give me Jesus. And, and that's what the gospel message, it's a very simple message. We celebrate simplicity here at Wellspring, and I don't believe that simplicity is a sign of weakness. I believe to maintain simplicity is actually a sign of, of strength. And, and so I didn't coin this phrase. Some other guy coined it. I forget who it was. But he coined this phrase that says, Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's the, the gospel message in, in three or so words. Jesus plus sign, nothing equals everything. That, that is the gospel message. And if you are to reverse that where it's Jesus plus something, then, then it equals nothing. That is not the gospel message. Because when we come to Jesus, we're not adding any, anything to it. We're accepting it. And at that point, we are then justified. And so how does this play into a legalistic approach? If, if they're going a legalistic way with the gospel message, why does this combat legalism? Because the gospel is free. The legalists are saying it's not free. You need to do, do, do. Jesus says that salvation, love, mercy, forgiveness, my, my provision for you is all free. Just take it. And the gospel message says, well, you have to earn it. You have to do, do, do. That the, the legalistic approach to the gospel would say that we initiate the gospel message by our good works. When, when, when God says, I've initiated salvation through Jesus Christ, he initiates the conversation. He initiates the relationship, not your legalistic works. Because Jesus is our pleasure. God finds pleasure not in our works. He finds pleasure in Jesus Christ who lives through us. The gospel is also freeing because Jesus is enough. We don't need to add anything to it. We are free now to live out of a place of holiness. That when Christ enters into us and the Holy Spirit comes inside of us, all, that at that moment, we, we are completely holy. We're not striving to be holy. We are holy. And now living out of a place of holiness, that is, that is where the gospel message becomes freeing. I'm not obligated to do, do, do. I get to do, do, do out of a place of holiness, that we are, the Holy Spirit is changing us from the inside out. And when we distort this message, we minimize the work of the Spirit, we minimize what Christ has already done, we minimize what is already ours in the gospel message. And so there was this dude named William Randolph Hearest, and I read about him this week, and he's this dude that, for, he started the, uh, the New York Journal and uh, so back in the day, he was a pretty well-to-do man, and uh, he, he was in L.A., then he moved to New York, started this journal. He had, he had a lot of uh, journalism in, in his background. He, he became a man of great wealth. He had a lot of uh, political involvement. I think he ran for mayor, ran for political office with the presidency. I think he failed in a few different areas. But he had, he had gained a lot of wealth, and he had an average political career. And in his wealth, he chose to buy art, buy art, buy art, more art, 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 art. And... Uh, and so to the point where celebrities were traveling to his house and walking through his house on appointment and to, to look at his house almost as a museum to look at his art collection. And uh, one day he's reading about a piece of work 
And so he says to his assistant, here's who, here's who made it. Here's what the art is called. Here, here's what a, it, it says it looks like. I've read about this. I have to have this piece of art. And so he sends his assistant out to, to find, to locate this art. His assistant takes two months to identify where this art is. He comes back to, to William and says, we, we have located great news. You already own it. <laughs> And uh, we've identified it. I've looked at auction houses. I've talked to museums and came, come to find out it's in one of your warehouses. You simply forgot that you already own it. And it's buried in one of your warehouses. Where would you like me to put it? And, and that's what, what happens when we, when we gravitate back towards this old way of doing this, old, old way of the gospel, old way of, of, of thinking. We gravitate, we lose sight of what is already ours. We already have the freedom that we're trying to earn through our, through our good works. When it's, when it's already ours, we can live out of that place. And so the gospel message demands our understanding we have to defend it, as we're saying. And so is there another gospel? It would beg the question if there's another gospel. And this is going to demand for us extreme focus. And so Paul is going to go on. He's going to say, I am astonished that, that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another, but that there were uh, some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And as we have said before, so I now say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you have received, let him be accursed. This gospel message demands our extreme focus because there are so many people looking to distort the gospel message. Paul is dumbfounded. He is astonished that he has spent so much time with these churches. And now, just a little bit after, they have gravitated back towards this old way of doing this, old way of doing things. Earn, earn. Earn, earn, do, do, do. And Paul, Paul is astonished. He's dumbfounded. He, 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 this is why we've named this series Red, White, and Deja Vu. Red, White, and Blue, that's the sign of freedom. And, and Paul is saying, like, Deja Vu, we've, this, we've done this. We've already been here. We, why are we going back to this? And you have freedom. Why are you going back to a place of slavery when this is already yours? And he looks at them, and he's using this terminology called desertion, turning, turning away. Uh, this, is, this is for me. I grew up in New England, so I'm a big Red Sox fan. There's a big Yankee Red Sox series this weekend where a half came out. And, uh, and so this would be if I came up on stage wearing a Yankee hat. For anybody in New Hampshire that would, if they saw me on screen wearing a Yankee hat, they would call me a turncoat. They, they would say, I've deserted, that I'm a sellout. And that, that, that would be a very bad thing. If you're in the in to the baseball world, there would be figures like a Wade Boggs, a Babe Ruth, a Johnny Stupid Damon, an Ellsbury. If you don't know those people, you can Google them. In my opinion, they're dirtbags. For you, they're probably heroes. But this is what it means to desert and to, and to say, I'm loyal to this, and now I've deserted it, and, I, and I've switched my allegiance to something else. This is for the Galatians. This is looking like for them. They, they put on new clothes. And in some biblical terminology, they would say that you put on the clothes of righteousness, that they've tasted righteousness. They've tasted perfection. They have perfection. And now they've reached back into the garbage can, and they have pulled out their, their old, dirty clothes of works, and, and they've put that back on. They've, they've switched allegiances by changing their clothes. This, this is the type of terminology that Paul is using here, falling back into a works-based thinking. And for us, desertion, as we talk about the gospel message, it's not merely an intellectual switch of our allegiance. Paul uses the term him, that, that, that this is a change in the relationship, that we're turning from, from this relationship with Jesus Christ, and now, and now I've, I've completely changed my allegiance to something altogether different. It's no longer Jesus Christ. It's no longer about Jesus. My, my allegiance becomes pleasing other people, and actually, I become the focal point in the workspace thinking. And what I love about this for you and I, because we can probably think of friends, we can probably think of family members that have maybe once were on fire for Jesus Christ, and, and now they're, they're off doing their thing, that this is written in the present tense, that the desertion is written in the present tense, which would mean that it's a process, that it's not a finalized thing, that there is hope for us to contend for the gospel message, contend for our friends, our family members, and to, and to go at them with the true gospel message, the simple gospel message, and bring to them. So don't stop contending and keep 
working for it. Because in their, in their thinking, as, as they have gone other places in, in, this, in, this, in their lives and with the gospel message, they, they, they have simply misunderstood the gospel. They have cheapened grace. They, they have looked at grace as a license to sin. They have looked at it as like, I am free, I'm forgiven, and so now I can just go and do whatever I want. And now, or maybe they've gone a different approach. Maybe, maybe they're not off partying like a rock star, but maybe they're now in that approach where I need Jesus, I've accepted Jesus, and now I need to add all those things that we talked about adding to it. Now I have to read my Bible. Now I have to go to church versus I get to, I get to, I get to. And they're just miserable people trying to continually earn, earn, earn God's favor. And so the second you add to something, it's no longer grace. I can graciously give you my watch but every time I see you, if I ask to wear it, and I make you make, let me wear it, it's no longer grace. They're trying to add to it, and it, it no longer becomes grace. Paul has to come hard at these people because this is a young church, a young church that is very vulnerable. You know people early in their Christian faith. They're vulnerable to all sorts of messages. And so Paul has to go hard at them and use that, that word accursed, which, which means that... Uh, that they have it coming. <laughs> and uh, that, this is Paul. Paul doesn't give two rips about PC. If you, if you follow Paul throughout the, the New Testament, he is not big on PC because what he's kind of saying here is that you're messing with some vulnerable people. Be damned to hell. Be damned. Like, don't mess with my people. He comes at them with very hard language because he sees these false teachers reversing an order that shouldn't be reversed. If you look at what he writes in Ephesians, he says in Ephesians that you are saved by grace, not by works. And, and then he goes on to say that you are saved to good works, that we are saved and, and out of our salvation, we do produce good works. He's, he's good with holiness. None of this is to, de, to, to belittle holiness. But what Paul says is there is an order to this. Saved and then produce good works. Not good works and somehow that produces salvation. And so these false teachers have reversed the order. And so Paul comes at them so hard saying, be damned for preaching a gospel message that's a, contrary to the true gospel message, because if you preach anything opposed to the true gospel message, you're not preaching the gospel. You're preaching something altogether, altogether different. And that brings us to the point of this, of this section, is that there is only one gospel message. It is not all roads lead to heaven. It's not that you can, you can do you, I can do me, and all of a sudden we'll be good. The gospel message is simple, and it's real. It is the only way. And so Paul understands that this is not something that can be misunderstood, that, this, that there is no equal, there is no add, adding to it. And so how do you and I, if we're young in our faith, or, or if, if we're honest, what this should, what this should convict in us is, is this reality that if they've deserted, the people that we've led to Christ could also desert. And if we're honest with ourselves, we could also desert in our thinking, couldn't we, at some point? And so this is something for you and I to both protect and so how, how might we go about that? Not because we have to, but we get to be in God's word. Not because we have to, but we get to be in a life group, chewing on things with other people. Not because we have to, but because we get to. We can go to church and chew on God's word. We can watch videos like this. We get to do those things to stay grounded in truth so that we know when dirtbags are trying to lie to us with a false gospel message, we can identify it as just that, false. You're not going to add qualifications to the gospel. The gospel says, I'm already qualified and that Jesus is enough. Any other type of message is a cancerous message and we need to avoid it all at all costs. And so these are two glasses of water. Uh, this is food coloring, but we're going to pretend for a second that it's poison. And, uh, and so if I was to dump all, if, if this is a deadly, deadly poison, I can mix this in here and make this turn real fast and make it look contaminated. And then if this is actually poison, we would look at that and we would stay far away from it. If, if touching it or drinking it would instantly kill us, if that's what this concoction is, we would, we would see that as easily contaminated and we would want nothing to do with it. But, but if, we, if we are to take another pure glass, the pure gospel message, and just one little drop, come on. it's not completely contaminated, it's just a little contaminated, but it spreads very quickly. And even a little poison to the gospel message 
there's a difference between the two. Would you drink any of them? Would you drink the one that just has a simple drop, just a simple, set, simple alteration? Would you drink it? Anything opposed to the true gospel message is something that we have to fight hard against and have nothing to do with it to protect against the cancerous nature of opposing the true gospel message. And so what, what then inspires Paul? He's, he's on attack. He's written a whole letter. These are, these are people he values and loves. And, and so what, should, what, what inspires us to uh, defend? And this is where we, it demands that we look at our motives. It demands a motives check. Paul finishes out the section by saying, For am I seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I'm still trying to please man, I would not be a servant. The Greek word is slave of Christ. He uses the slave word to, to say that I've switched my allegiance. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, he is my master. So if my, my pure motives is to please God, not you all. If my motives is, is to please man, then I'm going to go back into that old way of legalistic thinking and keep doing, doing, doing to try to earn people's favor, to try to earn, to make myself look good, to puff me up. But because I'm a slave to Christ, the beauty of that, my motives are pure, that I'm trying to please him, not men. And, and if you look at Paul's language, this accursed behavior, this, this, this word, wording that if he's going the legalistic approach or he's going to try to please people, he's not going to come hard at the Galatians. <laughs> he, he's going to be a little, little like, he's going to be wishy-washy. He's going to be like, okay, yeah, you do you, I'll do me, and, and maybe we'll try to meet in the middle someday. Like, but he goes hard at them because he knows, I'm not trying. My motives here is to please God above anything else, not to please you. And it's to protect the people that are being misled. And so Paul's not saying that I need to be a jerk, but he's saying that I need to defend what is being attacked. That's my motivation. Speaking the truth in love, but while we do that, we should expect opposition. If your goal is to be liked, then you're probably not a fruitful Christian. If you uh, aspire to be cool, you should probably aspire to be faithful. And as you aspire to be faithful, you will face opposition. What these Judaizers are, are saying is that Paul is, is, is starting this message with Christianity light. Like this, this entry-level Christianity that he doesn't really care about holiness. And that you need to add to it to be holy and to be like Jesus Christ. And Paul, if, if you know anything about Paul, he's not, he doesn't need the Judaizers to fill in the gaps. Paul cares very much about holiness. He writes to the Corinthians. He's, he's calling out church leaders. He's, he's going here. He, what he, he takes holiness so serious. He takes sin so serious that he's willing to preach a gospel message about a Jesus that died for said sin. He's preaching a gospel message, encouraging people to live out of the holiness that they have received, to live from a place where they already have attained freedom, not try to obtain it. It's been obtained for you. Paul cares very much about holiness and living a life worthy of the calling that you and I have received. Live a life worthy of Jesus Christ who died and lived that holy life for us. And so we fight for holiness because that best represents the gospel message, the gospel of grace, the gospel of freedom. And so what are you willing to fight for? What freedom are you willing to fight for? What is your hill to die on? What do you take serious enough to fight? I, uh, I, I was the youth pastor here for a while. I used to live right around the corner. On lunch break, I used to weigh a little bit more. I was about uh, 120 pounds heavier. And, uh, and so at lunch, I would leave my desk up in the corner. Oh, actually, I was in a trailer. I would leave my trailer. They didn't like me too much. So they put me in a trailer on the side for about seven years. And then they kicked me out and said, oh, you can have an office. And then six months, I'm not bitter. And, uh, and so I, I would go home on my lunch break. It was right around the corner. And a normal lunch for me would be to make a whole thing of mac and cheese. Sometimes I didn't use a bowl. Sometimes I just ate, ate it right out of the pot. And uh, I would take the whole thing of mac and cheese. And then I would microwave two hot dogs cut them up. I would get them a little crispy because I really like that. I like well-done hot dogs. And so I'd make them well done. I would cut them up. I would put them in my mac and cheese. And then because this isn't cheesy enough, I would, I would also then add a whole bunch of cheese into my mac and cheese. And, uh, and that was lunch. And then a few hours later was dinner. And, uh, and that's how I lived my, my life. 
that was my, my gospel, if you will, when it comes to health. And, uh, <laughs> and I got convicted, there's a whole long story to that, but I, I changed some things and now I feel like what this, this isn't healthy and I didn't produce anything healthy. And, and I think uh, I've changed some things, that, which is I think would be healthier in regards to food and, and, and health and, that, and whatnot. And, uh, and so you'll see a picture on the screen that I, when I lost a bunch of weight, my clothes didn't fit anymore. And I, I kind of got into this place where do I keep my clothes because what if I get fat again? Do I get rid of my fat clothes or do I, do I keep them like as a fallback plan? Like what do I do? And I was like, no, I've changed my life. The old life sucks. That was miserable. Like, if I'm honest, like, huffing and puffing to walk to the car is not fun for anybody. And I don't want that life no more. And so if I truly think that old life is dead, I can get rid of these old clothes. And, and so I did. I got rid of them. And if, I, if my clothes get tight, I don't go buy new clothes. I get my butt back on the treadmill. I, I go back to that healthy way of living. I don't try to fall back into the old way of living. And because I've seen what, what healthy looks like, and because I've seen what unhealthy looks like, my motivation is not to tell people, yo, if you get this mac and cheese from Walmart, cut up a few hot dogs, it's wicked good, you should give it a try. That's not my motivation. Because I've seen what that produces, I don't want that. What, rather, what I want to do, what I should be doing, is telling people, here's a healthy way of life, and here's a healthy way of eating, a healthy way of drinking, a healthy the way of taking care of your body. My motivation, because I've seen what it produces, what I've seen the good of it, my motivation is to teach a healthier way of living. And since Paul has tasted, since the Galatians have tasted what good and healthy looks like, why on earth would they go back to mac and cheese and hot dogs? Why, why wouldn't they live out of a place of freedom? And so this gospel message, we must defend the true gospel. We must know it to defend it. What is the gospel? It demands our understanding. Is is there another gospel message? No, there is not. It demands our extreme focus. And what inspires us to defend? It it demands that we would check our motives, a motives check for us. And so a holistic approach to the gospel demands that we don't fight for freedom because freedom is already ours. It means that we live out of a place of freedom. It's a, it's a minor difference, but the implications are drastic. And so we hold fast to the true gospel message. So again, what is worthwhile for you to fight for? What hill are you willing to die on? It says the gospel of peace, but yet fight for it. Isn't that a contradiction, to fight for peace? It's, again, it's not speaking the truth with, with just clobbering people. It's speaking the truth in love. There's a way to fight for peace and love. And Paul's saying, we want peace through the gospel message. Fight for it. Fight hard for it, but do it in love. Don't, don't forget, don't, don't make that equation with love and truth unbalanced. And so what, again, what hill are we willing to die on? My, one of my issues with the modern church is that we have so many hills that we're dying on. We're defending so many aspects of Christianity. So many, every hill is our hill to die on. And yet we leave wide open the one hill that we should die on, the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Those other things are so secondary, and we forget to fight for the one hill that matters. And so I, I want to apply this with, with a, closing, a closing example, a hotbed issue in our society. And it's, it's based on a book that I read uh, called Befriended uh, by some Saul's, Scott, Scott Saul's, something like that. I mean, whatever, you'll Google it, you'll find it, it will come up. And uh, this book, Befriended. And he, he, he talks in this book about abortion. And at first I was like, yeah, this is obvious. I'm a Christian, pro-life, huh? And and he, he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm pro-life, and I fight for the unborn. There's a song that talks about fighting for those that don't have a voice, and, and that is good, and that is, that is needed. But then he's like, I, I was going to preach to my church, and so what he did is he went out to abortion clinics. He went out to doctors. He went out to people that have had abortions or were considering, or moms, or this, that. He's like, I, if I'm going to be true to this, I need to get a full perspective. And what he came up with is that both sides, pro-life or pro-choice, you're really only defending one of the people, 50% of the people involved. If you're pro-choice, you're, you're defending the mom. If you're pro-life, you're, you're, you're defending the unborn child. Rarely do people on either side defend all parties involved. And so as, as, as we are clobbering people with this pro-life issue, 
Are there times where we can come across where we care more about saving a life than restoring a life? Is, is there a time where we're clobbering a mom over the head, where we might even pick it? Why on earth would a mom who's struggling now and needing forgiveness, love, grace, is that person ever going to go to the picketer to find that? Never. And, and, and we forget, especially as, as, as a man in society, I, I can't even, even fathom what it would be like to be a young mom. Walk a mile in their shoes. Try, try to empathize for a second where, where you're pregnant and now all of a sudden your emotions are even more out of whack. But now you have the emotions of, a, well, I thought he was going to stay with me and he hasn't. You have the emotions of growing up in a society that will hammer you over the head. You get pregnant, your life is over, you're done. You're good for nothing. And, and what that produces is this fear. Fear, and then all of a sudden it happens, and now they have to live in this place of fear that we as parents of society have raised them up in. And so if we're honest, shouldn't we empathize with the mom and fight for the gospel message to transpose both for the unborn and for the mom? And this was a huge conviction of mine. There are Christian agencies that, that will fight for the unborn and fight for the mom, but it's, it's too few and far between compared to how many people are just fighting to end abortion. And so here's how this would play out in my daughter's life. And I honestly had to give this thought as I thought about pregnancy and how I would want the gospel, the true gospel message to play out in her life. I want my daughter to fall in love with Jesus. I want her to fall so in love with Jesus that the thought of premarital sex is unthinkable. I don't necessarily want to put the fear of God in her just to not get pregnant because it's going to ruin her life. That is works. Don't do something just because of the consequences. I want my daughter to fall so in love with Jesus Christ that, that to go against that relationship would just be so unthinkable. For me... What would happen if my daughter got pregnant, if I, if I raised her with that fear of God approach, naturally she's going to run. Naturally she's going to think that she's worth it. She screwed up, and now I'm good for nothing. The standard of perfection was here. I missed it. I'm good for nothing. Versus I'm living out of a relationship where Jesus says I'm already qualified. I'm already accepted. Yes, I screwed up. I own my screw up. I'm going to go through with this, and I'm, I'm going to accept that Jesus Christ still loves me and still wants me and still has a plan for me. I want her to live out of a place of the gospel message. Gospel message. And that's how I think this is a, can be applied to everyday life. I want to speak truth into all of my kids' life, and I want to speak the truth of the gospel message as you and I live out our lives. So that's my challenge for us, is I'm going to give a timetable, seven days, I'm going in a second pray that God would give us an opportunity. And my challenge to us is in the next seven days that we would share the gospel, the true gospel with somebody. Because if this gospel is worth defending, given what I think of society, I guarantee you'll find yourself in the next seven days, especially if you're praying for it, for God to give you an opportunity to speak up and defend the true gospel message. Is it worth defending? I believe it is. And so with that, let me, uh, let me pray. God, I, I do pray that as we close out this experience, Father, that you would give us an opportunity. Father, for us present, Lord, in the next seven days, for us that will watch this video in a few days, weeks, months, years, whatever it be, Father, in the next seven days of them watching this video, Father, would, would there be, Father, a, a movement of sharing the gospel in our community, praying for one, praying for an opportunity. God, give me an opportunity to share your gospel message, and then God, give me the strength to follow through. Give me the strength to speak up and not stay silent. Father, when we hear people adding to the gospel message, Father, and diluting it, and, and being a cancerous cell in, in the midst of the gospel message, Father, would we speak up and protect the beauty of a so simplistic gospel message that Jesus plus nothing equals everything. God, may we defend it, and may we speak up about it. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So as we leave here, we are united in the true gospel message. We are united as we share with others, and we will be a unified church around a unified, simple gospel message. Thanks for being here.
We'll see you July 8th. Thank you for joining us for this online experience. We are so excited that you tuned in. We have a big announcement. Starting July 15th, we are doing something called Relentless Love Week. You may have heard of our CKAs. We are spending an entire week, Sunday through Saturday, to love on our community, and we want you to be involved. So in the description box below, just log on. We have projects, again, all week long, some for kids, some for all ages, uh, mornings, nights. We want you to get plugged in and to relentlessly love Tom's River all week long. So sign up, and if you have questions, Questions, you can reach out to Jillian. Her email is also down below. We'd love to get you plugged in. And don't forget to join us next week, July 8th, right back at OCC, as we'll have another worship experience. Thank you so much for watching. If this was your first time with us, we hope you enjoyed that message. And if you call Wellspring Church home, different ways to give are listed in the video description below. And please subscribe to our Facebook, Instagram, and this YouTube channel to be kept up in all the newest content from Wellspring Church.